Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephen Mallory, the manager of Historic Structures and Landscapes here at the Peabody Essex Museum. And tonight I'm welcoming you to our historic house talk with the renovation husbands, Stephen and David St. Russell, in celebration of pride. We're joining you live from one of the museum's 24 buildings, the Gardnery Pingree Mansion. This is one of uh, uh, several historic structures owned by the museum, and it's really a flagship building that was restored uh, a few years ago and um, is a major uh, national historic landmark, quite frankly. Um, this evening we'll be discussing what it means to live with history um, and kind of comparing and contrasting museum life and historic houses in a, in a uh, public stewardship type of format versus what you have to come home to every night. Um, I'd now like to introduce Stephen and David. Stephen St. Russell is a virtual pre-construction manager and holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Architecture from Massachusetts College of Art and Design. David is a Salesforce consultant and holds a BS and MS in Science from Springfield College. Together, they are husbands with a passion for bringing old houses back to life. Their current project and home is in 1893 Queen Anne Victorian in the heart of Dorchester, Massachusetts, and is the most recent example of how this duo innovates and renovates forgotten homes. The best part is their, per their perpetual virtual open house via their blog and social media. Follow their renovation and the husbands behind it um, at Renovation Husbands. So I would like to thank these gentlemen for coming to see us and open the floor to them. Thank you so much for having yeah, us. Thank We're you. so happy to be here. So our first question to open our conversation is, have you ever renovated any homes previously or is the Victorian in Dorchester your first? And what draws you to this renovation process? What is the magic that caught your eye? So it's not our first home. This is actually our, our third home. Our first home was in 2013, I was still in college in architecture school, mm -hmm. and our rent was being raised, and we thought we could we could have a mortgage with this could cost. Could swing a mortgage <laughs> yeah. instead of rent. So we looked everywhere. We found a, a nice house in Walpole, Massachusetts. Um, that was in need of some work, and it was in our price range, and it was built in 1910, so an older home, um, and we just fell in love with the process. Yeah, I think we did it right. We bought a home that was old and hadn't been updated in years, um, but functionally was fine. So we didn't really have any skills at the time um, and we could take on projects as we felt comfortable. So in all respects, it was the perfect way to get started and um, really is where we started to develop our skill sets. And where we kind of fell in love with working yeah, projects we, together. We found that we um, like spending time together on the projects and problem solving was really good for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just, it snowballed. Yeah. That's fantastic. Now, so this is a project that, the that, that you didn't have a, a mechanical systems and, and things like that that were a huge front end loaded stress and you right. could kind of get into the project and enjoy it rather than the panic of being just surrounded by a renovation. Yeah, yeah it was mostly cosmetic. A lot of fixing up walls, painting, doing a kitchen and bathroom project. Doing yeah, exactly. Outside. So when we got into, the, into those technical things, we could ease into it and kind of navigate the problems as they arose. So learning how to do basic plumbing all the way up to redoing the bathroom completely. Same thing with electrical and other systems. Mm -hmm. And then of course it was all a lot of cosmetic stuff. So learning how paints work and learning mm -hmm. how molding works and stripping paints and you know all those fun things. That's great. Now in Walpole, in this particular neighborhood, did you have to uh, navigate the historic preservation process from a public standpoint with regards to a historic district uh, getting uh, approvals for exterior changes that you want to do and things like that. Yeah, there wasn't any kind of like historical society that was um, dictating what we could do with the house. We had more to do with any updates we did to this house. We didn't want to price ourselves out of the home or do beyond market value. Yeah, so we had to be, we definitely had a balance in this. It was the, it was East Walpole, so it was the older portion of town and we were trying to be respectful of kind of the neighborhood aesthetic, um, mm -hmm. but it very much is a starter home. It's not, you know, a super old Victorian as an American Foursquare. Mm -hmm. They're, they're yeah. fairly common homes. So it was just a launch pad to um, kind of where we are now. Yeah, and there's a lot of things we learned in that house. There's a lot of things that we did in that house that I probably wouldn't do in our current house. Sometimes like I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't side in vinyl again, Yeah, but I tried yeah. to make the best decisions that I, I, we could at the time. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. 
That's yeah, very interesting. And as far as do you, in choosing a home, are you really conscious? What are the leading things that go in that that uh, strike your eye beyond like the romance of a great piece of architecture mm -hmm. or opportunity? Or are you looking for a neighborhood that is um, you anticipate is going to become uh, that it's on its way forward? Um, or, you know, real estate values right now are, are really confusing to a lot of people mm -hmm. and in a lot of ways right. kind of inflated at the moment. And, you know, choosing a place to live or a place to invest can be really tricky right now. It can be. That's true. I don't think we had that insight. Certainly, we, when we bought this property, we didn't know. We were coming out of 2008. So we were kind of riding the wave up. Um, but we didn't know the area. We met with the realtor and said, this is our budget. Where can we go? We had to move out of the city. We commuted to Boston in order to afford it. And for this, this property, our current property, we had a little bit better of a sense. But in this case, it was less about the, you know, we loved the neighborhood. It was less about value. It was more about just loving this home and thinking that there was no way we couldn't do it. So at what point in the process of this project, the first house that you renovated mm -hmm. in Walpole, did you say to yourselves, we can do this. Uh, this can be something more than just renovating a home. This can be a whole other new business, a, 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 a mission. How did that yeah. come about? I, I think it was probably too early for that yet. We think we were still falling in love with the process and, and we shared it kind of piecemeal with family and friends, but once we hit the new project is when we were excited to start sharing it um, yeah. from the start. Yeah, we didn't have any business um, goals going into actually either project. It was mostly about sharing the process and it evolved to what it is today, which is, is very cool. Um, but we never had, that was never the plan. Right, it isn't that interesting? Of, yeah, it kind of happened, which is, I think the better way. Right. I think so. something I mean, is born out of passion. Yeah. Well, and it's really hard to um, just jump into let's start a renovation business. You know, you have to get your feet wet and you right. have to learn the skills and you have to kind of sweat a little bit to learn, you know, how all this stuff works yeah. and, and that sort of thing. So how long did you live in that house before you decided to take on the next project? We had a 10-year plan that quickly turned into a five-year plan, which quickly turned into a two-year plan. <laughs> Our friends weren't in Walpole, they were in Boston. So the opportunity aligned for us to sell it. Like I said, the market was on an upswing, so it was you know a good it was good timing. Mm -hmm. And then we went back to being renters for two years and uh, actually planned to do that for a little bit longer until we found the right spot. And that's when this property happened, the, the, the Homer and now happened. We drove by it and um, in two weeks we were making an offer and it all happened very quickly. So yeah. it wasn't, none of this was really thought out. It just kind of happened. <laughs> we're not we, big future planners. Yeah, we're not planners <laughs> at all, for sure. <laughs> well, one of the things that I think maybe people watching might be interested in, and especially as things change, and I myself live in a historic house, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago was a very different landscape when it came to buying something that was uninhabitable mm -hmm. um, and getting financing for it and having codes that are much different than they were even 15 years ago sure. as far as international building code and its impact on the building. And if you renovate more than 50% of the house, it changes what you can do with the windows and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and all this sort of stuff. And getting construction mortgages for people can be really daunting, especially if you're dealing with a big old house and presenting to, let's say, a lender uh, an estimate for what you're going to do for the work and then how you're going to do it and then the timetable mm -hmm. in order to get disbursements and things like that. Like, do you have anything to offer advice yeah. or, or what on how you were able to kind of go into uh, a house that needed everything, essentially? Was it inhabitable? It, wa it wasn't. So that was okay. something we definitely navigated and learned a lot about. And we, we knew nothing going into it. We knew there was this house. It was a shell. There was no walls, no plumbing, no electricity, nothing. So it w 
I think we were in a sweet spot where it was too much work for a contractor to make a quick flip, mm -hmm. but it was way too overwhelming for a small family. Like you would need to, you know, ride across a couple of, you, you would need to like have somewhere to live right. while you did this renovation. So we used a special loan type called the 203K loan where they kind of roll in the purchase price and the renovation costs into a single mortgage. And you're exactly right. It was really, we had to figure it out kind of on our own how disbursements worked. Yeah. Um, and it was not easy and the loan was kind of expensive. Yeah. And what was the minimum of things we needed to do in order to move in? Yeah, when we moved in, we only had, we had a, somebody asked us today, we only had a toilet and we didn't have a shower. We didn't have a kitchen. We didn't, I think we might have had the sink already. Yeah. But we were eating in the backyard on the grill and going to the gym, which is if you had a, a kid, you obviously can't swing it. So right. we, uh, you know, it just worked out for worked us. Out. Well, that's fantastic. So you weren't beholden to a host of inspections and then a, a, a certificate of occupancy. We did. No, we were. <laughs> we were. Or, or, okay. Yeah, yeah, we had to do that. We, um, they gave it to us with just the toilet, I think. Amazing. Thinking back, and like you need like one cabinet for a kitchen. Oh yeah, we had a cabinet sink. that wasn't attached to the wall. It was just in the room, and uh, we did have to do the inspections that where they verify the work was done to yeah. release the escrow. But it was part of playing the game, and I think it's a it was a great route, and a lot of people don't know about it. Yeah. So looking it back, us, allowed us to it allowed us to do it. And oftentimes cool. those mortgages, once you complete the requirements of it, 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 another interest rate comes into play and they're expensive up front, but then they don't have to be for like the rest of your life. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's really important for, you know, people out in the world to also know that a lot of this is so dependent from, from community to community to community. And if you want to take a project on like this, it's, really important to do your homework yeah, and figure yeah. out what the constraints are. I've seen so many people who bought a house and didn't, it, it wasn't disclosed to them in, it could have been the real estate agent, it could have been whoever, that it's in a historic district and that right. there's legislation and right. that you have to go before panels to change this and, right. you know, and that sort of thing. For example, difficult. when we do work here uh, at the PVD Essex Museum on any one of our historic properties, and anyone else who's a private homeowner in this neighborhood, if it, if it involves an exterior change, they have to, you know, explain that to a historic commission and get a certificate of appropriateness. And right. if mm -hmm. it's something as simple as painting or a, a repair, it's a certificate of non-applicability. Yeah. But there's no, there's nothing that governs really what you can do with the interior oh, of a home. Yeah. It only affects its national register status. Yeah. For example, you know, if this is on a, the National Register of Historic Places, or if you wanted it to be, it is, but it's also a National Historic Landmark. Um, if the outside of it met historic preservation criteria to be included in a district in the neighborhood, great. But if it had been gutted to the studs on the inside, it would maybe not be National Register eligible if right. certain character-defining features were missing. But that's only, who cares as long as, it, only if you want your house landmarked right other than that um, you know it has no in, there's no permitting and, and that sort of thing unless you know for example you need to do a huge electrical or plumbing project you might have to pull permits to do something like yeah. that right but right. other than that it's not so constrictive and I think that so many people think that in the world of historic houses that if you get into that there's always well they're going to tell me what color i can't paint my house and it's yeah it's always a nightmare story and yeah. it, and it also oh if it's on the national register we can't do anything with it well the national register only protects you from a federal takings standpoint yeah. hmm. you can put your na your house on the national register today and then get a demo permit tomorrow and the, and as long as the there's no local legislation stopping that. You can do what you want. There's, yeah. It's not as constrictive as people think. And I think hopefully one day we're looking at a new day for historic buildings where people love them again because yeah. they've got you're, – you're in something that you just can't get in a cul-de-sac. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think we're there. We see that on social media all the time that, like, there's a new love for old homes that I think is coming to the forefront. That's fantastic. And, and that really leads us right into our next question yeah. for you, which is um, character is frequently mentioned in conversations around historic preservation. Just what we've talked about. The house has this it factor. Mm -hmm. There's just something there that you just don't mm -hmm. get by other means. 
and that you really can't fake. Um, <clears throat> how do you approach ch making the choices in your historic houses and uh, highlighting its historic character and where do you really find your inspiration for the choices that you make in a renovation project? Yeah, I mean, so, so we had kind of a unique situation where we bought this house and someone had already completely gutted it. So we were, we were down to the studs, um, but there were still some really beautiful architectural features still preserved, like the staircase you're seeing here, or the entry. So that's what sold us. When everything else was down to the studs, we could still see it had beautiful bones and a lot of characters still there. So what we had to navigate as we continued the renovation is how do we add back character? We're not the historical purist that needs to find the exact molding that would have been there, but how do we uh, respect the house's age while also giving it our own style? So adding molding that is traditional to the, to the era and just highlighting the features that um, the, the home already has, and then as we're adding to it, still still respecting it. And we didn't we didn't have this figured out when we bought it. We it took us a long time to kind of navigate um, what we wanted to do with the house. It was a little bit overwhelming because usually you go into a home and it's old, but you have par parameters that you're working within. Like yeah. the mantles are already there. For us, the home was gutted, so. We kind of had the freedom to do everything. It was we said it's like a blessing and a curse because there's no horsehair plaster anymore, but we had to figure out what to put back. So it definitely evolved over the time. And now we're at a place where things feel like they're cohesive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I'm like I'm surprised that we got there because <laughs> I don't you know, it was a learning curve. The, we learned how to do it while going through the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we I think we are left with something that we um, feel really proud of yeah. it's fantastic. and feels very cohesive. I think that when we went into the project, we had this idea of because we had this opportunity and we weren't, we weren't ripping anything out ourselves. We were like, okay, we can come in and do this juxtaposition of traditional and contemporary. And, and that's what we did with our kitchen, our first project. And now we're, we're seeing it now that we've done all these other spaces that we, 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 the house has really told us to lean into the traditional and, and we've kind of found this the sweet spot, like you said. Yeah, that's that's fantastic because of what I'm seeing in the photos is that there was also still a lot left to work with. You've got that fabulous Queen Anne staircase mm -hmm. and some mantelpieces, and enough that you're not. It, it was it wasn't really just a shell. Yeah, we had and, some direction left there for Some us. inspiration to pull from. Right. It, right, and so here's a question for you also, is did you find living in a Victorian home is a lot different from living in a federal style mansion like this or a colonial period house where you're dealing with, one of the things that's, that, in, that is a, a setback by today's standards often in houses that are much older than this is functional obsolescence. The plans don't circulate the way people want them to. In the Victorian period, you're dealing with something a little bit different where there are more open concept plans and rooms that relate more closely to the way modern people live. Did you find that, to what extent did you feel like you had to modify things like the circulation of the house and the sizes of rooms and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, so, so the person before us who had, who had got it had started doing a little bit of shifting stuff around, some good decisions, some decisions we didn't like, but basically what we did with the floor plan is we kept all the existing rooms in their original shape. We did more larger cased openings and okay. opening them up to, e to each other so you still have distinct rooms. Mm -hmm. um, Victorians love doors. We right. have a lot of doors. <laughs> yeah, um, we used to have a lot of doors. We used to have a lot of doors, but we didn't want to go back to full open concept. That was something that we were definitely avoiding. Um, but the rooms do, like Stephen was saying, have these larger openings mm -hmm. that allows for the flow between them. Pretty, yeah. yeah. And they also generous proportions to the rooms as well. Yeah. Yep. But things like giving giving a little more room to the kitchen that was before a very small working that's kitchen. True. Right. Um, and so that's where so many people live today. Right. And so you yeah. know that it's not only something that's functional, but it's, you know, you can never kind of put your finger in the wind, but I think one of the things about these family kitchens that have developed in the last 15 years, I, I, I don't see a lot of 
evidence that it's ever going to re- we're going to return to galley kitchens mm-hmm. and and, right. and that sort of thing right. unless you're in a condo or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And so these are sustainable choices it sounds right. like that you're making. Yeah, we we did make some decision like we had a conversation kind of with on Instagram recently about where people eat and people are very divided. We'd made a conscious decision to not have seating in our kitchen for instance. We have a dining room and we want to use it. So um, we definitely thought about how we were going to use each space and optimize it um, for what we were specifically looking for. Somebody else might have taken a different direction right. and made the living room a, an eat-in kitchen, but mm-hmm. um, we stuck to the original format. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it also, even if you don't have an eat-in kitchen necessarily, but you have a dining space, it just seems like in the American experience, Cooking and socializing while you're cooking for people you're entertaining is something that just happens. And so yeah. everyone, I know it from our house is we could have 40 people over and everyone winds up in the kitchen yeah. while you're cooking and exactly. that sort of thing. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter if you can eat in, but it's communication between yep. spaces right. and So and for us, like that. while we didn't have seating like at the large island we have, it opens up into our living room with a big opening. So people can be sitting in the living room and communicating. And not feeling isolated and, and that right. sort of thing. That, that's, that's fantastic. So a big question, and this relates to um, renovation today, this current ongoing project and using historic preservation. Mm-hmm. How has COVID impacted a whole host of things? Um, where uh, the pricing of materials is out of control, Mm -hmm. Um, contractor availability, contractor labor prices, letting people into a home to work that you're comfortable with, um, and uh, and that sort of thing. I'd love to get your take on if you had an experience in in that direction. Yeah, we um, went through the for sure, the, like being home for a year, fairly unscathed. I mean, we're doing all of the work ourselves, so we weren't relying on third-party contractors, thankfully. Um, and we kind of saw it coming, so we also stockpiled um, some materials, like all of the woodwork we get from a local lumber yard, and we just ordered a lot of it yeah. because we knew the projects that were coming up. So we tried to get ahead of the game that way. We entered COVID as uh, participants in the One Room Challenge, which is a six-week intensive challenge where you transform a space. These are some images from that space. Oh, wow. So we redid our entire suite, and it ended up being uh, eight weeks, including the the bathroom and closets, which we'll get to. Um, And we used that momentum just to move into our next two projects. Thank Thank you. And those were um, the dining room and parlor projects, which you saw images of before. Thanks, guys. That's fantastic. So um, I think to your point, though, now we're really feeling it. So yeah. it, it seems like we're coming out of COVID, but we are really feeling the um, supply and demand. Yeah, the del- the lag for us in our kitchen project, which is the next we're going to talk. We're, what we're going next is the kitchen project. And uh, we're seeing the issues with cabinets. And we're seeing issues with stone. And we're seeing the issue with appliances. So we're definitely feeling it now. Um, yeah, that's whereas before it was, yeah. it was all about, it was all unknown at the very beginning when we we didn't know what was going to happen. Well, and we didn't know that a nineteen dollar sheet of plywood would go to sixty seven ninety nine. Right. Yeah. Thankfully, we haven't needed any plywood. Thankfully. <laughs> yeah. Somehow. Yeah. We're avoiding plywood. And things like you know uh, the framing lumber for floors and studs and and things like that. Um, it, it's, uh, it, you know, it's still kind of interesting to see how unavailable things yeah. are. Right. And, um, and and how you wouldn't think that a thing like COVID would propel so many people into want to dump money into a house. Right. But, right. you know, that Everyone is, everyone's yeah. doing it. Yeah. We did have, um, we did work with a friend, um, Ken DeCoste, who is a great woodworker. He actually did the bench you see in this image on the left and our built-ins for us. Um, he, you know, that was something we had to navigate was having him in the house during COVID and we were, um, it was a little bit scary, but we took our precautions and yeah. thankfully that, you know, we didn't have to do a lot of that, so. That's that's really good. I mean, from, from the uh, museum standpoint, we've been 
for over a year not really being able to have the public enjoy the interiors of our houses because of all of those reasons. Uh, We've developed more virtual experiences that are, you know, walking tours, video tours, and, and that sort of thing until those days change, which will actually be on July 1. Wow, great. Um, and so I, I, can't, I, I can't promise you that this mansion is going to be open right at the crack of 10 a.m. On, on July 1 because it will be phased into a certain extent, but our ropes mansion will be, and that sort of thing. But we, I found that personally working at the museum, Contractors getting contractors. They were they're busier than ever. They're yeah. working fourteen hours a day, seven days a week. It's, it, I was surprised to find that it was actually harder to get people uh, lined up to do projects for us than than it was before. Yeah. The materials were a significant uptick um, in project costs to a certain extent. But then when you kind of realize something like, well, we're putting a $48,000 roof on a building and the shingles, which are already very expensive Mm -hmm. to get, you know, Alaskan yellow cedar or or something that's high quality, they went up, but by the, it really impact the project by a couple of thousand dollars. Right. It wasn't like we're, we're ruined. I think what you see is contractors have so much work. We, we got a couple of exterior quotes. And because they have so much, they can kind of demand any cost that they want. You know, they're, they're getting, they can be picky about their projects. Mm-hmm. So right. I think we've seen a definite impact on the quoting side for projects. Mm-hmm. Um, so it kind of plays out there as well. I mean, they have all the jobs in the world right now. Right, right. And that, that's, that, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. And so how do, how do you feel with everything that we've talked about uh, so far about you know, what you've done with the Victorian and the choices that you've made, um, f- living in a historic home that is highly functional to you versus something that's kind of a frozen in time museum structure. Are there areas of the house where you said, we're going to play with this hmm. so that we can preserve the fly in amber over here and have that moment in the house that is really a step back in time but the trade off is we had fun in something that that maybe was less impactful right yeah yeah you can go ahead i think the the thing that we tried to keep our entry is the only original piece left in the home so we tried to keep the entry and then the parlor interesting like the floors are beautiful um, we don't have obviously in the parlor any of the original anything. So, but we made those two rooms. I would say probably the least functional. If that's what we're talking about, um, and probably the most like precious rooms mm-hmm. in the home. Um, the rest of it was really kind of the wow spaces. When yeah, they're like when you walk out. in, or where you like you might. Um, we I mean we wind down in the evening, kind of in yeah. the parlor. There's no TV, and we're on our screens all day, so we don't have those there. And that's what we wanted those spaces to be. We wanted to be somewhere you could sit and just kind of enjoy the space, um, and where we did something interesting and maybe uh, a little less functional. Right? Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. I think so. So when you're talking about spaces in the home where there was framing and partition layouts that mm-hmm. were original and maybe flooring. Yeah. But there your the plaster, the woodwork is gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you made a choice that was not okay, this is going to be a totally modern space where we can escape from antiquity every yeah. once in a while and we want to put it something back that is a, a, a representative of what was there um how did you get the information that you wanted to put the rooms back mm-hmm. and and how did you how did you inform your choices on whether you, you know it's gone <clears throat> we can't bring back something from 1893 but we can put something back that is re- representative or responsible right. like how far did you go where did you make the cuts yeah, yeah. i mean the internet man <laughs> i mean the internet is is awesome and in, in, in instagram specifically we hmm. we're lucky enough to be friends on instagram with a lot of people who own other old homes um so we're always drawing inspiration from them and seeing 
details that, oh, that could have been what was in this room or... Um, yeah, we, we also did like, we live in a neighborhood of Victorians. Right. So we have beautiful homes all around us and we're very lucky to have that. So it's like walking the dog at night and peeking in people's windows. You know, the first floor lights are on and you can look like, oh, they have a built-in in, in there. We could, we could do that. <laughs> um, so some of that. We also have, you know, the, the homes were very much, like every home in our neighborhood was built in the same year. It very much was a development. Yeah. Right. Of, the, of its time. It was so a street, streetcar suburb. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You could conceivably go to a house, any any number of them, and the, the millwork could be yeah. Yeah, the same. Exactly. Same it, wasn't, it, yeah. it was the same builder who built all of them. And it wasn't just as copy and paste as it is now. They Every Victorian kind of stands on its own. But they duplicate specific features. So you might go to a Victorian that looks a little bit different, but you're like, that's our entryway. Yeah. Um, right. So you do see things repeat or we found, or a friend found for us our tiles around our fireplace were from a catalog of the time. Sure. So there's only so many of those things and you do see them repeated. We have a twin house to our house just diagonally from us. That's exactly the, the same. Um, so, you know, it was kind of doing that, those tours and, and visiting people. Yeah. And fortunately, you know, for a house built in 1893 and in a, in a kind of instant neighborhood like you're talking about, yeah. um, it, at that time, millwork was all mass produced. Mm -hmm. And so your chances of, of finding something duplicative right. are really are, are good. And even in salvage. Yeah. yeah, and I think because there was so much of it, like all of these homes in Dorchester popped up around the, in the same couple of decades. When you look at a lumber mill today, like we go to Anders and McQuaid, and they, the profiles are really representative of what was, like that period of time kind of stuck. Yeah. And we see a lot of the familiar um, profiles. I think you asked earlier, like how we pick stuff. And in our entry, we have a base cap. And the one we found was almost like completely identical. So yeah. that's what we used to the rest of the home. Perfect. So, you know, those those things kind of did stick around. Our, our, the period in which our home was built, I think, yeah, you can still access. For sure. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, and we're dealing at a, with a time right now when there's just never been more access to information. Right. And, uh, you know, photography, like you're saying, Instagram. I mean, when I was at graduate school a thousand years ago, it was, expe if you're documenting a house or researching a house, you know, you're, <clears throat> paying 12 bucks a roll for film and getting 24 <laughs> pictures. And then it costs another 12 bucks to get them developed. And so people just didn't document. Right. Yeah. And now it's just click everything and, and the world's at your fingertips, which is really amazing. Yeah. yeah. And there's been a lot of interesting debate in the museum world and cultural resources and things about how much of your historic house do you just put out on the internet with a thousand photos? Yeah. <clears throat> The argument at one time was, well, if you put it all out there, they're not going to come and see it. And it's exactly the opposite. Yeah. When's the last time you pulled up a restaurant you wanted to go to and you saw the picture menu and you said, well, I've seen it, so now I don't need to go. Yeah, I mean, we saw the image of this room and being in it is a very different experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the scale is you can't really capture, you capture until you're in it. And that image has made us want to come. Yeah. yeah. And it's really, th this room, the long, of course, you know, talking amongst ourselves you, it's hard to kind of for you guys to absorb but all of the subtleties of this house that you you have to just be alone with it to to get it after a while you know <clears throat> for 1804 to have every one of these medallions and all of those urns hand carved yeah. where by a single master whereas if this house was in boston if this house was in new york at the same period all of this same ornament, except not quite as good, was cast composition yeah. and yeah. shipped by the container load. And if you happen to spend some time with McIntyre's carving, you'll see that the, the fruit basket over the mantelpiece, because you're meant to stand and look down at it, it's right. carved from that perspective. And if you so cool. and then if you look at the one over the 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 the, the, the double leaf doors, yeah. you see the bottom of the basket because you're looking up. Right. Wow. And every single one of these baskets in all these houses all over the North Shore that he carved, there are no two alike. 
and each has a pomegranate and the grapes <laughs> and the this, but he was an infinitely curious master carver. And another thing that's really interesting that <clears throat> that uh, I'd like to bring up about this house and see what you think about your clients in similar capacity. When John Gardner hired Samuel McIntyre to build this house in 1804, mm -hmm. um, Samuel McIntyre was a self-taught but genius architect. And he was friends with a man named the Reverend William Bentley who had a 4,000 volume library right up the street and he was loaning books on classical everything. Yeah. And the we, we have all of the, 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 the elevation and plan drawings for this house. Also embedded in John Gardner's receipts, his accounting books, you can piece together how this house was constructed mm. and so when you look around the room at the furniture and the carpeting and the paint colors and the paintings and things it's all in probate documents this is one of the first restorations where we can say these were here yeah those mm. those those vases that are on the mantelpiece are those vases wow. and they were but more importantly than that McIntyre was one of the first people in America to get a client like yeah. John Gardner and then work out the design for a very expensive mansion. And then not only that, but McIntyre, oh, the architect builder of Salem, he didn't frame walls and lay bricks. He only did very high-end exotic carving that no one else could do and architectural plans. But another service that he offered with, with in this house is a perfect example, is how he would work with the homeowner to develop the color schemes yeah the paint the carpeting the furniture mm. uh mcintyre carved the details on all of these chairs That's and, incredible. and they were not uh they're often given credit for being oh mcintyre furniture uh, scores of cabinet makers across salem were making these chairs by the gazillions and mm -hmm. mcintyre would dress them up in carving to the extent that the client wanted or could afford so this is like the first one of the first examples in american history of the coordinate quote unquote coordinated interior mm -hmm. where he was working with the homeowner on all levels it wasn't just right. the rich guy builds the house and then goes out and buys expensive stuff to put it in right. so right, right. long-winded but to it but my question for you is to what extent do you guys engage with clients in in things that go beyond the renovation of the house and into whole lifestyle uh choices and that sort of thing yeah we're starting to navigate that process so we have started to open the conversation about working with clients and kind of understanding what our role is going to be in mm -hmm. that process because mm -hmm. We do want to have, I think, a holistic approach, approach to it, not just um, the architectural piece, but kind of like where, you know, how they want people want to use this space, all yep. following all the way through to project, um, management. project management and working with contractors to make sure it's done properly. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a conversation that we are having and starting to navigate and figure out ourselves. Um, so stay tuned. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> that's, great. Yeah. that's great. Well, there's, I'm sure that that's a, there's a, a huge opportunity there to be not just the guy that fixed the house up, but be a go-to right. on so many other levels. Because, yeah. you know, you're, when, you, when you get into the antique house situation, it's a lot more lifestyle you know, than right. than than living in something that was built in the '90s, and, yeah. you know, or, or whatever. There's you get, for better or for worse, when you take on an old house, you take on to a certain extent everybody else who ever lived there. Yeah, right. And um, they can be noisy sometimes. <laughs> That's, yeah, that can be sometimes the fun of it is that you have these parameters you have to work within, and you want to be respectful of, yeah. but also make a place that like a family can live in today. Mm -hmm. right. So it has to be accessible. Right, exactly. Right. So that leads to our next question. You've been so well received in your neighborhood and on social media. Uh, how have those relationships really developed since you work, started work on your current home? So you parachute in from 
Nowhere. Um, Walpole. <laughs> yeah. And buy this Victorian yeah. house on a corner lot in Dorchester and more. Yeah. yeah. Well, that then that X image shows you what it looked like when we drove past it the first time. Yeah. It was, wow. board, it was boarded up on the first floor. But a fantastic lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great spot. And um, I think that's what drew us to it. Yeah. We could obviously see the potential in the house. And it, it obviously had been not taken care of for a very long time. Yeah. And I think the neighbors, of course, all noticed that. And and when we came in, I think there was some hesitancy of what these people are going to, what are they going to do to this house? Or are they going to carve it flip up it? before? Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. We had a lot of people walking by trying to probe who we were. <laughs> They just thought we were the guys cleaning up the lawn, but we were the ones who bought it. Turns it turns out you yeah. were. Yeah, we were like, no, this is our house. We're not just a landscaping company. Um, so there, we did have a lot of questions about our intentions with the property mm -hmm. because that is something that's been known to happen. Somebody might buy a Victorian of the size and rent it by the room. Um, wow. So, you know, those kinds of things happen. A lot of these homes were built to be multifamily homes. We have ones that are across the street that are to family and we, and I, I kind of love that. The Dorchester is the triple decker town, like mm -hmm. three family homes. So there is a place for it. Um, what I think people are nervous about is an absentee landlord right. who's not taking care of the people who live there or keeping the house up, um, you know, obvious, I mean, you know, I think they were scarred because they went through several homeowners. The, the house flipped over a few times and this is what they've been left with for about the last, you know, six to 10 years, yeah. I think. But wow. we found an amazing community in our neighborhood. And we I did. think everyone's yeah. very excited that this house and so many other houses are kind of br being brought back to their potential. Well, it's also really cool when you talk about this house and the curiosity of the neighbors and then some other details of the neighborhood. It reminds me kind of when I was living in the D.C. area and was hanging out in Del Rey, uh, friends there and stuff. This neighborhood reminds me a lot of that where it... it, it you you can have the restored house and then you can have the triple decker right. and what what it means is you've got a diverse community exactly. which is so much better than everything gets just cherried out and mm -hmm. then you you're displacing in a lot of cases like a community like Dorchester I'm sure that you've run into people who have said well we've been here five generations mm -hmm. or yeah. something like yeah. that yeah. yeah it's a balance of maintaining an affordable neighborhood for the people who've lived there forever and also not letting the neighborhood go to ruin. These homes, are, well, I think what we run into is are really, ex it's expensive to keep them up to date. And what you find is they all have their own cycle. So like we have a whole neighborhood of Victorians and then one, one day, one summer will get redone and it's now beautiful. And, they, and then over time it will need to be redone again. Yeah. But um, they're all kind of going through at their own pace, and it's kind of a really neat thing to watch. Yeah. That's great, and it's not one developer buying up a street, right. and it's right. not yeah. it's people who are invested in the in the community and 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 loving their homes. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, uh, just out of curiosity, based on all the photos that we're seeing, it looks like the you know we say oh the bones of the house are mm -hmm. good or, or whatever, but and it, clearly they were, and it, even though it had been the plaster had been taken down and that sort of thing. But did you have any, like, right out of the gate, the roof has got, we got to put 30 grand into a new roof or the you know, structural or, or were, did you actually have an envelope to work with? Well, what was nice with it being all gutted is that you could see everything. Yeah, we didn't even have an, ins we didn't even get it inspected. There was nothing to inspect. Like, right. Like the foundation, <laughs> the there. old granite foundation looked fine. And um, you can tell where floors settle and you have what looks like a normal settling floor and a not probably normal. And you could walk through and we had a sense that things were good. There was a, a the roof was redone, thankfully just prior. And the only really big thing we were forced to do because of the, the bank loan was paint the exterior. So that was the only thing that we were held to other than getting an occupancy um, was getting the exterior painted. Yeah. So you had to kind of front end load the exterior yeah, yeah, we were going to hold off on doing it, honestly, because there's there's so much more work that needs to happen on the exterior of the mm -hmm. house to kind of bring back all those details. And we were going to wait until we could really afford it. But because due to the loan, we had to make sure there's no chipping paint and just 
Yeah, it's a, it. it's a Which leg, we, I'm uh, glad we did. I'm but. glad we did too. Now, is that something that you did? Were you 33, you know, were you 30 feet up on a extension ladder? No, we, no. we uh, you know, we had a three month period to move in. Um, so we, in the, in those early stages, we were, we worked with a contractor because we had to have a licensed contractor on the project. We lined up the exterior paint and if we got the um, initial rough plumbing done for us, um, the insulation and the walls put up. Mm -hmm. So we walked up with fresh plaster. We did plaster throughout. Yep. Um, like I said, a plaster and a toilet. Yeah. So, but no trim, no trim, no paint, no nothing else. So we we did get a little bit of a head start there in the beginning. That's great. So can we hear about your future projects? Is there what happens beyond the Victorian? That are you going to stay in this one? Are you going to uh, use this as a launch pad for other things? What have you got? In the I didn't I didn't know this was going to be a controversial interview. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we're in this place now at, at the house that we've done all the bedrooms, we've done all the main rooms on the first floor, um, and we're kind of now circling back to the first project we did in the house, which is the kitchen I mentioned earlier. We ended up putting in a very contemporary kitchen, and the materials that we used were kind of not doing so well. So we're redoing the kitchen right now and kind of looking to make it uh, more sympathetic to the to the age of the house and yeah. then beyond that i don't know this like. was something we spoke about like we learned the direction we were going as we went mm -hmm. the, the kitchen we designed while we were living in like a studio apartment in the south end yeah, in a loft. Wow. and yeah. in a loft so we had a very modern kitchen in front of us and we were playing with this idea of making a very modern victorian mm -hmm. like you know kind of playing with those two things and then as we did our projects, we realized it wasn't working and we had already done the kitchen. Yeah. So we we're gonna go back and we're gonna do it again. I think we have a rendering. So this is what it will look like. So, so it obviously is still a contemporary modern day kitchen, but playing it into- It clearly nods to- Yeah, and that's what I, in, in, in designing these rooms, I like using the materials that you could have found in the house and using them in maybe a different way, making the island look more like a piece of furniture, like a work surface in the middle of the kitchen, using marble, which would have been used. Um, so it's been fun to kind of play a whole new take on mixing contemporary and traditional, not just inserting a contemporary kitchen into mm -hmm. a traditional house. And also making a choice and then living with that choice is gonna tell you mm -hmm. oftentimes Oops. Yeah. <laughs> Versus it worked. For right. sure. Right. And when it works, you know. Um, and then when it doesn't work, it's you're sad. Yeah. And we're, <laughs> and we're able to integrate pieces from the original house. Not There are a few things that were saved, like in this pantry. We're going to reuse these original pantry doors. Um, so you can see it's natural wood in there. Mm -hmm. um, and they and were preserved. It looks preserved like a steam beautiful. radiator that was probably converted to hot water. Yep, or so we, we, we are big fans of radiators, so we definitely kept all of those. But they are hot water now, um, which is nice. But yeah. those will stay. Did you find that you had opportunities and was really the, the com I don't want to say the community of the neighborhood, but the community of builders and incentives could you make green choices where you could say, well, we're living in this big old house, but we, since it's open, mm -hmm. we can move to another level with ener energy efficiency and, and things like that? Yeah, for sure. Luckily, because it was all open, we were able to fully insulate the house, which wouldn't have been there before. And even if we came in with the house that still had all its plaster, we'd probably do blow in and it wouldn't have been as effective. So. Luckily, it's really, really tight. The person before us had replaced all the windows. So we don't have the original windows, but they are all con contemporary windows. So they do have some, a little better of an R value there. Um, so we're always thinking about that mm -hmm. in terms of our choices. Yeah, the insulation mm -hmm. was definitely the big piece. Mm -hmm. um, having it like fully and done without probably, walls. And is it like a natural gas boiler system or something? It is, yeah. So it's a hot water boiler. Um, so it's pretty efficient, hot water too. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things, too, that you struggle with so much with an antique house is there are things that you normally love to do. Like, you can't put solar on a house like that. Right. And, yeah. um, and that sort of thing. And so you make up for it in other ways because I think one of the things that's so fascinating and that I, I, I wonder what your thought is on this about one of the things with all the historic preservation projects that I've done myself privately and for museums is that 
they're inherently green things hmm. because when you if this was a private home and you're renovating this for for yourself or a client it's already here right you're not filling a landfill you're not cutting down more trees that uh it they're inherently upcycled sustainable things yeah yeah you can we think about that all the time you might have an old refrigerator and there might be one more efficient but it's it's actually more beneficial just to keep the, the cost of replacing it and yeah. putting your current one in the landfill and shipping a new one to your house right. over the life of that appliance is probably less green. Right. right. Um, and the same goes for old windows with storms. An old window with storm that's properly glazed um, is going to be just as good as a new window potentially. Well, exactly. They can properly, uh, you know, this is scientifically proven yeah. that yeah. A, 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 a restored wooden window with a proper storm is about 90 to 95 percent as efficient as a modern window replacement window except two things these windows can be restored right. indefinitely right. for 500 years yeah they aren't a two thousand dollar unit that in 15 years the gaskets fail and the gas goes out of the insulated glass and the no warranty or the, the company yeah. says lifetime warranty but they don't exist anymore and yeah. All this, this once you get into a replacement window cycle, you mm -hmm. are always on a replacement mm -hmm. window cycle. Yeah, we face that ourselves. I mean, the previous homeowner put in vinyl windows, and unfortunately, they were not very high quality. So we've run into instances where we've already had to replace windows that are like less because than ten years breaks, old because yeah. I can't get the component or I can't fix that piece of plastic. Where if we had original windows, to your point, it's really easy to pull one out and fix it. Right. Right. That's fantastic. So the green label isn't always the best thing. Sometimes it's just best to stick with what you've got. I think it's the story. Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, you can see this from so many ways, right? I mean, do you want to spend a house like this, which has probably 36 windows at least, um, add that up, 2500 bucks a window for something, eh. Right. Are you ever going to get that money back in the savings of the heat bill being lower? in the number of years you're going to live there no and then you have to replace them again yeah right. correct yeah so i think um what we probably should be thinking about is moving on to the q a session and uh danielle i think has some questions for us yes absolutely thank you, thank you all for your time this afternoon it's been a wonderful conversation i have some really fun questions cool from zoom and youtube so the first, someone says, I am obsessed with the green color in your parlor. How hard was choosing the colors in your home? That is a, a great question. Um, just repeat the question, how hard was it to choose the colors in our home? Yeah, um, sometimes harder than others. Yeah, I mean, from the very beginning, we were lucky to have some great help with our friend Josh from Evolve, who, uh, Evolve Residential, who helped us pick a couple colors. And uh, yeah. especially that color was one that we he picked and we loved and we ran with it. We did, yeah. So that's Colonial Verdigris. Mm -hmm. We get asked that question a lot. Um, and yeah, it was one that we used and we haven't changed and we don't plan on changing it. Yeah. Fantastic. So what advice would you give to someone who's interested in starting their own res renovation process? Oh, this is easy. One, don't be afraid. Like you, you, could, you could spend the next 10 years being afraid to start a project. So I think going into it, being excited and then know that you're not going to know how to do everything out of the yeah. gate. We started um, w by turning a coffee table into an ottoman. <laughs> That's our first project ever. And we learned so many things. We learned how to tuft. We learned how to use a stapler. We yeah. learned how to buy fabric. So you just take off little chunks that you feel comfortable with and those skills will snowball. And give you courage to and take give you step. Yeah, that, you know, do it, finishing something gives you a lot of, um, you know, energy to do the next yeah, thing. Yeah, you become proud of it and you can do more. Amazing. And speaking of the next thing, um, someone says, I love learning about your process and your thoughts and sharing your photos. Is there perhaps a book in your future? Oh, God. Oh. Is this a publisher? <laughs> asking this question? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. We're open to anything. So we've never had a plan. And that's what's yeah. kind of fun about this is we... We've just jumped in, and if yeah. somebody comes along and it makes sense, sure, we'll make a book. Oh, <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Those are our questions from the audience. 
So I'll pass it back to Stephen if you want to just wrap it up and say good night to our audiences at home. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks. Well, this has been a delight to yes. talk to you in a historic house yeah. about Beautiful. historic houses. And we'd love to have you back, and we'd also love to offer you tours of our historic houses anytime. Yes, mm. um, uh, I love to give them myself and show us, uh, I can show you four centuries of American architecture as well as one 18th century Chinese merchant's mansion. <laughs> <laughs> And um, if there's anything else you'd like to add, um, that would be great. But I'd like to just say thank you so much on behalf of myself and the Peabody Essex Museum for joining us and yeah. for this celebration of pride and new life for historic houses. And um, to the audience, I'd like to say good night and thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. This has been a lot of fun. It's been amazing.